Good evening. Welcome to MED 2107NAX Thursday evening. It is October 22nd, 6 p.m. And uh, like I stated in the, uh, the shared white screen, discussion one, task one, and lesson one are due today. Um, if you don't have it in now, get it in before closing of business, 10 p.m. tonight. I'll even give you that much. In theory, it's due right now, 6 p.m., but hey, I'm not going to look at it until uh, later on this evening. I have a, I have a uh, midterm to take. So um, let's look 21078X and let's look at week two. Let me move this down here. And I have to be sh careful in sharing videos because I've been warned by Google that I'm playing our videos too much, which is weird because this is for educational purposes. We're not making any real money out of this. But hey, if, uh, if that is the case, I'll just redo the video and, and, and post an, an alternative link. So let's look at task two. And again, uh, kindly mute if you have not done so already uh, your... Um, uh, your microphone and you can you can interrupt if you want or i'll try to i'll try to monitor the uh the chat as well so last week we were i guess we were talking uh about immunity but non-specific immunity um let's see am i in the right oh yes non-specific immunity like um and some examples were of course your skin and your mucosal lining and uh your clotting um yeah, um, clotting functions. But this week, we're going to talk about specific immunity. And chapter 21 in the textbook, and I'm going to try to be more on the textbook, uh, because you, you guys, um, uh, especially those of you who had me before, already know how to break up videos and know how to um, uh, do that for not only making notes, but for also um, um, uh, constructing your um, concept maps. So what are we gonna look at this evening is your type of lymphocytes or the white blood cells, uh, lymphocyte development in bone marrow, what are lymph nodes, spleen, uh, what does your spleen do for you, what do your tonsils do for you, and, um, and we're gonna do, a, we kind of went over the innate immune system, but we're gonna review it again. But the innate immune, um, your innate immune system is things that you were born with. Right, these things will develop uh, during time, but the innate immune system, we already talked about it last week. Think skin, mucosal lining, um, and also, uh, yeah, it's it's the same. If you look at this, it's the same um, uh, goals here. So let's jump to our open stacks, chapter twenty one. You, and if you're on your main uh, course shell, right in here, come here, table of contents, chapter 21, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, oops, oops, too fast. And we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about the uh, lymphatic and uh, uh, the immune system. Now, typically we study uh, uh, the lymphatic system along with the cardiovascular system. Okay, let me get this out of the way. So the lymphatic system, wherever you see an artery and a vein, of course, there's also going to be a nerve. But wherever you see an artery and a vein in your body, there's also an associated uh, lymph vessel. And you can see here, typically they're colored green uh, for... Um, you know, identification purposes in, um, uh, you know, in a diagram. But as we already know from our dissection, nothing's really colored green, uh, but we see green and sometimes even the lymph nodes, uh, um, they're, they're colored even yellow uh, because of a significant uh, fat content. But typically when we're talking immune system, we're thinking um, green. Because part of the, uh, the non-immune function of your, um, your lymph vessels, which are all these, these green wires here, 
and your um, lymph nodes is to is for um, fluid balance. So any extra fluid that are in your arteries and veins and vice versa can be dumped into the system in order to maintain fluid homeostasis. Because remember, there has to be a balance between uh, the amount of fluids we have and our electrolytes and all of that. And sometimes we have a little bit too much in our arteries and veins and we don't want our blood pressure to go sky high. So our system dumps some of that extra fluid uh, for not only blood pressure, but um, uh, fluid maintenance uh, as well, and vice versa. If we need more fluid, we can, uh, we can gain some from uh, um, lymph lymphatic tissue. But its primary system of the lymphatic system is, of course, specific immune system. And we already know a little bit about this because what happens when you get a sore throat or whatnot? What happens to your cervical chain of lymph nodes? the lymph node starts swelling up and we could see that clinically. And it's also the reason why when you do your breast self-examination, you're also checking the axillary lymph nodes, which are the lymph nodes located here in your armpits. This is also the reason why clinically, if you have any abdominal cramping or pain or any genital urinary problems, I am now gonna start tickling you. Well, it's not uh, intentional, but you know, when you start doing your abdominal review, it gets ticklish for some people. But what am I looking for? I'm looking for any positive lymph nodes or lymph adenopathies, lymph adenopathies that would light up. And if you have a genital urinary problem, I can tell you right now, um, the lymph nodes will start filling up with lymph fluid and white blood cells. So you got to start thinking of the lymph nodes as kind of like a, like, you know, like a, um, like a, a, a cop or a, um, like a, a sentry station. Um, for those of us that uh, had military service, you know that you can't just have one big base. You have these little tiny bases all over the place so that you can have QRF or quick reaction force uh, to try to deal with something. So let's say I had like a little bit of a sore throat. Maybe I had a little um, pharyngitis. What happens to this little uh, forward operating base, right? This will get filled up with soldiers. And who are, our, who are our soldiers? That's our white blood cells, our lymphocytes, and also the, um, the, uh, the lymph ve uh, vessels. And then when the lymph vessels start filling up, right, and then they start filling up this lymph node, the lymph node becomes positive. Therefore, you'll have positive lymphadenopathies, either um, unilaterally or bilaterally, depending on you know, how bad the infection is. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a toothache. It was here on the right side. So what happens? Part of my cervical chain of lymph nodes lit up on the right side. Um, um, and, you know, that's why the doctor is feeling under here, under here, 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 and here, and even behind uh, your knees, because when you have an infection, it kind of points it, it, it kind of points it out uh, uh, where things are. And you could see here how their um, uh, lymphatic vessels are closely related to, and you could see this, I know this is, um, and, um, and well, unless it didn't say so, it looked like the artery side or the oxygenated side of a, a blood capillary. Because remember, capillaries are both oxygenated and deoxygenated. It's where the veins, which are deoxygenated, meet the arteries, which are oxygenated. So that is the structure of the lymphatic system. I mean, not the structure, but the, uh, but the function of it all. So you have lymph nodes, and then you have, um, um, you have also lymph vessels that connect all the nodes together. Now, the cool thing about these nodes is that it, there's an immune function. The not so cool thing about it is this. Let's say, for example, this lady right here, unfortunately, has breast cancer. She has breast cancer. The cancer can metastasize or move from wherever the, um, the initial foci or focus will then travel and it will go other places. That's why um, if somebody has breast cancer, if it's malignant, it'll start to travel to your breast and it'll start to travel to, uh, to your lungs. Um, and um, before the lungs, I think it hits the, your rib cage first. Um, I can't remember my oncology as, as well as I do, but you could see how um, that, you know, our soldiers, the lymphocytes can use these pathways and these roads 
Unfortunately, the bad guys like cancer and infection can also use these pathways as well. And we're also checking for positive lymph nodes in cancer as well. And like I mentioned, that's why when you do your breast self-examination, you always check your armpits as well, okay? So we now know that the lymphatic system has two functions. One, homeostasis for fluid control, right, or fluid balance, and two, um, it is also has, of course, um, immune function. And you can see here, you can see how intimately involved it is with capillaries. And then you have the arterial, very, very small artery. You have your venule, very, very small vein. And where they connect is, um, and where the gas exchange occurs is here. And it's also where uh, lymph vessels are also intimate with uh, your capillaries, okay? So, do, 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 do. isn't this one of our um, uh, functions that we, oh, before I go, there's also major duct, duct work or major um, sequestrations of lymph fluid. And that's why I'm always checking your, uh, your sternum and also uh, your upper abdomen because we have the thoracic duct here right? And here it comes at the level of your chest, hence the word thoracic duct, right? And then you have a large lymph, uh, lymphatic duct draining into uh, um, the rest of your trunk. So you have a uh, right lymphatic duct and thoracic duct, and they're just larger spaces uh, for lymph fluid. Now, did they go over what's exactly in lymph fluid? Let's let me go back. Uh, no, they did not. I think they're going to go over that later. But like I stated, what's in lymph fluid, of course, fluid, your plasma, which is the fluid portion of your blood. And that's important for hydration. And also it has a ton of um, uh, white blood cells. And we're going to talk about in a moment, all the different kinds of white blood cells. So the immune function, we already talked about, um, you know, your uh, your innate nonspecific response. And your barrier defenses are part of your innate. Innate meaning you're born with it. So that skin, mucous membranes, and of course, we kind of touched on it, um, um, homeostasis as well, and your clotting factors is kind of part of these barrier defenses. Now, there are specialized cells and soluble uh, what they call soluble factors. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But the nonspecific, they're not, they're not smart, right? They're just barriers or they're, you're just born with it. So we're going to be talking about certain cells that aren't smart. They just attack things, but they have to be told what to attack. Now, your innate immune response is pretty fast, but it's nonspecific. That means they could attack at will. And at times, especially with um, uh, an autoimmune disease, they kind of attack the wrong thing. There's a lot of friendly fire going on sometimes with autoimmune uh, uh, disease or dysfunction. Now, what is what requires some brains or some memory is the slower, more specific adaptive immune responses. And those are your white blood cells, right? Leukocytes, also known as your uh, lymphocytes. Now, the way they function is, is um, you could have phagocytic cells and they're part of the innate immune, immune response. Phagocytes are not that smart. They're, I, the, way to, uh, the way to describe them, analogy is, is like, I usually call them the thug cells or like the bouncer cells. The bouncer doesn't do anything until management or the, or, uh, the cooler does what? Tell them to go do something right? Uh, cooler or uh, I, I learned that term from that Patrick Swayze movie, um, uh, Roadhouse, really good movie. So phagocytic cells, right? They ingest pathogens and they destroy them, but they're innate. They're, they don't think too well. But the lymphocytes, the, it's coordinated and it's part of your adaptive immune response. Now it takes a little while longer and also in order for lymphocytes and for specific adaptive immunity to work, the patient has to be exposed to the pathogen first. 
And that's why we're always promoting um, vaccines because you could be exposed to a pathogen without really being exposed to the actual full-blown disease, okay? Uh, um, that's why I find anti-vaxxers really funny uh, or people who, uh, who are like, oh, vaccines cause autism. I'm like, how? Uh, if you knew anything about this, and which you will uh, today, what does developmental delay have and um, brain and also brain and learning have to do with your immune system? Um, um, they're, they're separate pathways. So I find it very interesting, especially I have an autistic child. And then people always ask me, oh, did you get him vaccinated? Because maybe that's what caused it. No, no I don't think so. Um, but uh, lymphocytes, they're what specific, right? And that's also the argument that many people are, are making. And again, you look up the data, you look it up yourself and make decisions on your own accord. But there is a, there's a theory that states that if a child is not exposed to anything, if you put a child in a plastic bubble and you don't expose them to anything, if they're not exposed to anything, how are they going to, how are they going to develop antibodies and specific immunity to help them? Right, uh, which is which is a decent argument, but on the same on the same vein, when we give them vaccines, they're safe. They've been tried and tested on millions of patients before we even rolled it out. Um, uh, that's why I also find this current thing that by Pfizer, they're rolling out a potential vaccine, hoping it's going to get uh, approved. Why are you rolling out a vaccine before it's approved, or before it's even at phase four testing? That's kind of creepy. But again, that's the world we're living in. Um, there, are, um, there are two types of cells, if we look at this, our lymphocytes. Now, in the beginning, all the cells are what they call uh, multipotent or pluripotent cell. These are also called stem cells. And we've heard a lot of hullabaloo on stem cells because no one wants to do stem cell research because there's ethical issues. Well, no one in this country. They don't want to do it because there's a whole this ethical and legal matter that you have to deal with because where do we get these multipotent or pluripotent cells? We get them from fetuses. So when you're a fetus, you're, you are just, you're just uh, um, um, going to develop things. You did, this thing could be anything right? It could be a red blood cell. It could be anything. But our genetics, right, inside the nucleus then tells what? You're going to either be a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell. Now, that now outlines the two kinds of, um, two kinds of cells, uh, white blood cells. Right here, you see in the myeloid system, you could see these cells, basophils, neutrophils, and isonophils. Those are white blood cells that are uh, that have granules in it and if you recall your anatomy physiology one the granules remember um they um they take care of business they break down things they have enzymes in it remember lysozymes um in anatomy physiology one so these basophils neutrophils and isonophils um they're named after the kind of stain that they like basophil is basic uh um, is a uh, basic pH stain. Neutrophil is a neutral uh, pH stain. And an eosinophil is a um, uh, acidic uh, stain. So that's what gives them kind of that, uh, that color on the stain. In real life, these things, none of these things, if you just look at blood, they don't, there's, no, there's no different colors, but we have different stains to, to show different colors. And that's how this thing was named. So those are um, granulocytes because they got little granules in it, okay? Now, the agranulocytes are all these other ones. The agranulocytes, if you look here, right, um, you don't really count these as, as granules. Uh, they, they, they have granules, but the big thing about lymphocytes and um, the monocytes T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, they are uh, considered A granulocytes, even though these are large granules. So when you look at this picture and try to memorize it, you're going to start thinking what? 
okay, I have these are my granulocytes and these are my agranulocytes, okay? So uh, could I show you a picture? And if it has little, little tiny little granules in it, then it's gotta be either a basophil, neutrophil, and eosinophil. And another way we also identify basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils, basophil has like this one uh, uh, singular lobule, um, uh, what do they call that? Um, um, nucleus, yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. But if you look at the neutrophils and eosinophils, uh, the eosinophils, um, um, there's only like one or two lobes and the neutrophils have are multilobular. And these, this picture isn't um, accurate, but these are much, much bigger than this erythrocyte or red blood cell. The precursor for the red blood cell is called the reticulocytes. And that's why when my patient bleeds out, I'm going to look at the retic count or the reticulites, uh, retic count in slang, in medical slang, but the reticulocytes, that means I'm making a lot of red blood cells. And if I'm making a lot of red blood cells. Now, megakaryocytes break down into these little tiny particles that look like dots, and those are platelets. And the function of platelets we talked about last week, thrombosis, right, or thr um, for clotting, erythrocytes carry things, and they look like a little donut, right? Then you have the white blood cells, all of these, and then those are differentiated by the granulocytes, and then the agranulocytes, okay? Now, Let's talk about lymphocytes, T cells, plasma cells, and that NK cells. Let's talk about B and T cells. B and T cells, which are T lymphocyte and B lymphocyte, are um, B cells, um, they make antibodies. Oh, nasty, I got a huge fly attacking me. Uh, B cells and T cells are highly specific. And remember, if they're part of the adaptive immune response, that means it takes a while. They have to be exposed first, right? And then um, typically the basophils, neutrophils, and sonophils will take care of them the first time around. But then the second time around, T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes, especially the B cells or the B lymphocytes, they will make antibodies, right? With, it goes, and how do they remember the chemical structure? Well, every cell in this universe, as you recall from anatomy physiology one, has a glycoprotein coat. That glycoprotein coat is like, um, I, I make the analogy that it's like a gang, you know, your gang colors. Uh, what's it mean uh, referencing 80s movies? If you saw that movie, uh, Colors with, um, wait, now that's gonna bother me. But just know that the cells, pathogens, and also the good guys are wearing a little uniform. And that's the form of the glycoprotein coat. Now, an antigen is something that generates or um, excites an antibody. An antibody is a memory cell that the B cells create that remembers, hey, I remember that guy who was wearing, you know, uh, he was wearing, uh, you know, that brown jacket that said warriors on it. So I'm going to attack that guy. So the way the antibody and antigen work, they work just like the way we talked about the lock and key mechanism when we talked about enzymes. And that makes sense because once the, ant because once the antibody locks up specifically on the antigen, what's going to get released? All those little granulocytes that we talked about, and those have what? Enzymes in it to break down um, whatever that potential pathogen is. Now, the T cells don't do antibodies, but they're, they're also part of the adaptive immune response. And what is their function? Their function is to um, be the tattletales. And that's why I remember them as T cells. So you have the, the two major types of T cells, which is T helper, which is CD4 plus cells, and your uh, T cytotoxic or T killer cells, and that's your CD8 plus cells. And the way they work is they work in conjunction with um, uh, the antibodies up here is they're kind of like uh, the APC or the antigen presenting cell. So if they see some like antigen, some pathogen or potential, pa um, potential pathogen, they lock onto that chemically and then they release these uh, soluble factors. Once they release the soluble factors, it's like a whistle. It's a chemical whistle and it's like tattletale, like, ooh, teacher, teacher, over here, over here, this person's talking. And then the antibody, right? Or even, you know, macrophage. Remember I told you the thugs, right? Macro because it's big. 
and goes uh, natural killer cells, NK cells, right? And these guys will do what? Will now hover towards the area of uh, those um, 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 uh, those uh, soluble factors, which we can also see in our, your plasma. So if we also see an infection, there should be what? Increase the soluble factors. And we're going to talk about interleukins and interferons. And maybe you've heard of some of those, um, especially regarding HIV and also your immune response. So what could, what, how do I differentiate B cells from T cells? Of course, T cells will be what? CD8, which is uh, cytotoxic uh, T killers, uh, or CD4, which is T helpers. And CD4 is the major deficiency um, in um, HIV and AIDS patients. And you can now see that how um, previous colds or previous infections without T cells, you, there's nothing to tell your antibody what to do. There's nothing to tell the thugs, you know, the bouncers what to do. So you could see how very dangerous that is, okay? Now, another type of lymphocyte, plasma cells, right? And um, the response to antigens, natural killer cells. I already talked to you about, they're, they're, they're big, they're thugs. They're just like the macrophage here. And there's a lovely chart here that reminds us what things do. T lymphocytes, they send out chemical messengers, those soluble uh, factors. They're the tattlers. B lymphocytes, antibodies, right? Plasma cell, antibodies. NK cell, right? Think virus. And also think NK cell, think thug, right? Natural killer cell, eh, it's, it's just like the macrophage. It's big and it's stupid. And its only job is to beat on things. But I need the T cells to, to, to act as antigen presenting cells to tell me who to beat up. Okay. Now, where does all of this come from? Where does blood come from? Blood comes from bone marrow, both white and red blood cells. And your T cells are originally from your thymus, which is uh, in the middle of your chest, right? And it's kind of considered a vestigial organ because that the thymus is only um, really active when you're an infant and also um, in... Um, um, you know, uh, during your, you know, uh, uh, fetal development. That's when it's really, really active. Now, do, do, do. what are uh, uh, secondary organs, right? We, 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 showed, uh, we showed some of them. We already talked about lymph nodes, right? Lymph nodes, right, they're not only the, it states here, they're not only a, 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 a way station for the lymph fluid and for the white blood cells, it reminds me here that it also filters out because since it, since it goes through all the fluid in your body, it filters out like, you know, any other things that are in there. And it has macro, remember our natural killer cells and the macrophages, those are our bouncers and they go deal with things. Um, and if there's, there's an infection or there is um, cancer uh, present, right? Because that's also considered not part of your body right? Uh, and cancer cells look very, very different and have very different glycoprotein coats. So it'll be recognized as, uh, as a pathogen. And then all this will blow up and then we could, we could see it clinically. So that's lymph nodes. Spleen. Spleen is located in your left lower quadrant, right? Um, and it has two functions. One, it is a filter for your red blood cells. Red blood cells typically have a 120 day life cycle. And when it starts nearing close to 120 days, it starts, um, uh, it starts getting the shape of the red blood cell, which is the biconcave disc or that, um, show it back here. Remember that uh, picture here, right? The Cheerio or Lifesaver. And it's not, it's supposed to be pale in the middle. And in the middle of that, that's your hemoglobin. That's the thing that, that's the protein, hemo, blood, globin, protein, that carries things. What does it carry? Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and a whole bunch of things. So when we're looking at that, oopsies, not too far. 
when we're looking at the spleen, the spleen acts as a filter for red blood cells. Now, what happens when you have something like sickle cell anemia? It ruins the spleen because it's like, it's like throwing a bunch of rocks at a screen door because um, uh, the, the shape of the red blood cells is all messed up and now it's gonna cause damage and cause inflammation and infection of your spleen and then you get splenomegaly. And you could see here, not a lot of room to, um, uh, to grow um, and it really shouldn't grow out of hand. Another thing that the spleen does, it can hold up to like 50 to 60 cc's of extra blood, extra red blood cells, just in case anything bad happens to you, uh, like an accident or any blood loss. So that's your initial backup system for blood loss. So it has a both a hematologic protective function and also a hematologic filtration slash immunologic uh, function with the filtering of red blood cells. And that's your spleen. Lymphoid vessels. Now there are lymphoid. They look like lymph, but they're resembling it and they're very, very different, but they serve the same function as your lymph nodes. So that's why we get concerned when the tonsils get swollen. And a lot of people think this is the tonsil, this is your uvula. That's the rudder that steers food from your, um, uh, from your hard palate, which is up here through your soft palate and then down your esophagus. Um, uh, uh, via the smashing motion of your tongue. So this is the thing, this is not the thing I'm looking at. I'm looking at this and this when I, because when you have a sore throat, because if you have a sore throat or an oral cavity issue, these two things will light up. They'll get really big, yellow, green sometimes, or very, very red. And that's the thing we remove when, it, when you have tonsillitis, when it gets out of hand. Now, Another place that we have tons of uh, lymphoid tissue, and you could see it from that picture, and that's why I'm always feeling around your, your, your lower abdomen, is mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. A lot, of the, a lot of the things that are, go through our large and small intestines are dirty, meaning they got a lot of bacteria, and there's a lot of things there that are potentially harmful to me. And we have to keep that all in check. And one way to do it is whoever designed us, designed us pretty smart with payer patches within the mucosa. And the payer patches are mucosa associated lymphoid tissue because we already know what does mucus do for is a non-immune, it's a non-specific um, non immune process. So the mucosa traps all garbage whatever garbage that just happens to float by, and especially in the gastrointestinal tract, and these pear patches um, um, act like lymph nodes, okay? And we also have the same thing, BALT. MALT is for your GI. BALT is for your respiratory, right? So there's uh, a lymphoid follicle structures, and what do we have a lot of also in our lungs? We have um, uh, mucus, and it's the same thing. Right now, it goes, and it's also one of the main reasons why we should all wear our PPE. And I'm going to say it a million times over uh, so that it'll be ingrained. I'm not doing it to prevent an obscure virus uh, uh, from getting into me. It's there to prevent other things. Uh, and also, the degrees that, you know, it has been proven yet, but the decrease the viral load in theory. Right, because if you're not breathing all this air around and all this other stuff, in theory, you shouldn't be picking up extra things. But like I told you in Anatomy and Physiology 1, virus can go right through your skin, right through the cell wall. So if you're already immunocompromised, it's gonna get in there, right? So uh, we already talked about DNA, this was last week. And then now we talked about uh, T cells and B cells, right? B cells, antibody, T cells, uh, I want you to think what? Tattler, right? They tattle. They send out chemical signals so that, um, and act as an antigen presenting cell to go tell my body or tell my immune system, hey, bad things coming. Here's some of the barrier defenses. We already talked about that, that last week. Neutrophils, okay. And you could see phagocytosis, 
It's macrophage, neutrophils. Those are the thugs, right? Monocytes. These are the you know, their innate, innate immune response, but they're phagocytic cells, meaning what? Um, all they it's like Hulk, Hulk smash. Not a lot of thinking going on there, right? But with the combined with your antigen presenting cells, combined with your T cells, and combined with those chemical messengers, they can get uh, they can get to um, um, to do a lot of immune uh, protection. And we already talked about the recognition of pathogens. It recognizes the cell wall, the the glycoprotein coat on the cell wall, which is unique to everything and everybody. And um, also, uh, as a side note, it's also the way our blood typing works. Um, your red blood cell has a coating on it. It's a glycoprotein coat. And depending on if you have this antibody or that antibody, that's how we get the blood types, type A, type B, AB, and then O, and that's the ABO system. We're gonna talk more about that at another time. Now let's talk about some of these uh, soluble mediators or the whistle, the chemical whistle that's gonna communicate that um, from the antigen presenting cell to the thugs in our body, hey, go do something, cytokines, right? Cytokines and chemokines, they are, um, uh, they are these chemicals that when released, it screams, hey, you need to kill this thing. Interferons as well, right? Uh, they, they kind of tag the pathogen, right? It's like tattling, like pointing, chemically pointing and going, hey, we also have a, um, a complement. Complement are proteins that complement the um, uh, the immune system, okay? So all of these things can be found in the blood plasma. And then that's also the other reason why we, um, if I'm doing an immunologic assay or an immunologic study, I need it to be in a red top tube so um, the blood will clot and then I spin it down and what do I take? I take the blood plasma because it has all these proteins in it. Doesn't that sound like a beautiful all of the above questions? Where am I gonna find cytokines and chemokines? Where am I gonna find interferons? Where am I gonna uh, find um, a complement? Well, I'm gonna find it all where? I'm going to find it all in my blood plasma, okay? Uh, what is this? Oh, you could see here where the, the antibodies here, and this is, an, this is an antibody. It's the thing that's going to attack an antigen. And what they kind of are showing here is, is that it's gotta be like a lock and key. Like this has to be able to recognize the antibody has to be, a recon, be able to rise the antigen. Now here's the problem of, of um, um, autoimmune diseases. What happens when your antibodies cannot recognize self? right? Cannot recognize the good guys. So what will it do? It'll start attacking good things. And that's like friendly fire. Now you have complement, they call it C1, C2 and all that. And there's a, and you can see there's a cascade of it. Just know that complement, it goes, it's a uh, interaction. And then um, it's part of all these chemical messengers. So if you see a lab test of cytokines, chemokines, complement and interferon, that means we're entertaining, um, we're trying to get to the source of infection and what kind of an infection, okay? Now, big, big, big topic is the inflammatory response. Now, we already know, and there are now four characteristics, there's five characteristics to uh, an itis. Of course, heat, redness, pain, and swelling, but there's also the fifth characteristic of loss of function. And heat is calor, redness is rubor, pain is dolor, swelling is tumor, and loss of function is uh, uh, functio lasea. All right, so those are your five, um, 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 your, you know, five characteristics of inf uh, inflammation. So when you think about it, use your medical terminology powers. If I'm having dermatitis, on the scale of things, it's not so big of a deal, right? Loss of function in a small localized area of my skin. All right, I'll deal with it. Get you some 1% uh, cortisol cream and, and cream and call it a day. But if I had carditis, 
if I had pneumonitis, if I had hepatitis, that's a serious, serious thing because now the function is, will now be systemic and potentially global. So we'll look here. What happens? What's the process? Okay, how does it all start? First of all, the mast cells, which are uh, part of that family of phagocytes, NK cells, right? They're these, they're phagocytic cells. When they see, they see an injury, right? Um, they're going to uh, go and they're going to release histamine. And histamine has, gives us all these uh, characteristics. So, of course, one thing that histamine will do is increase uh, blood flow to that area. Okay. Uh, another thing that it will do, if it increases blood flow to a certain area, what's it going to start looking like? It's going to start looking like redness. And, of course, if I have tissue swelling, Remember those uh, Pacinian corpuscles that are in our skin? If you have increased pressure, you're gonna have starting a little bit of itch and then it's gonna turn to pain. And then everything is gonna get all swelled up because do I want any of this infection to travel any further than this area? So you have sequestration of tissue fluid, everything gets swelled up, it gets, uh, there's, uh, there's localized redness, there's, um, there's also pain to tell you, hey, go deal with something. Um, we already know that um, diabetics, it gets scary because um, how are their blood vessels and how are their um, uh, nervous system at the level of the skin? It's not very good. That's why we're constantly doing foot patrol or uh, looking at the, uh, the feet of our diabetic patients because they have wounds and, and infections that they didn't tend to because it doesn't hurt. Um, so after the histamine increases the blood flow, and we talked about how it relates to all these uh, the five characteristics, right? Now, all this damage now uh, is sending uh, messages to other thugs, other uh, big cells like phagocytes to do what? Deal with the current pathogen that we have here. So it's not only just mast cells, it's mast cells, histamine release, and um, 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 phagocytosis by other big cells, all right? You have to have vasodilatation because I gotta get blood, I gotta get white blood cells in the area. I also need increased vascular permeability because I want tissue fluid to start um, gumming in that place up so that the, um, the pathogen has nowhere to escape. And of course, we already talked about the recruitment of phagocytes through um, uh, chemical messengers, right? So the big boys like the uh, macrophages, right? And uh, can get to where it has to go to. And that's the inflammation process. But you could see how, um, remember we want homeostasis. So we don't want this to get out of hand. And um, out of hand inflammation um, will cause some serious, serious problems. Now, Adapt uh, benefits of the adaptive immune response. That's easy, right? You remember things, but you have to have a secondary response. It's slow, but once it gets there, that means uh, once you're exposed, that means you, uh, you should be able uh, to fend off, um, um, uh, to fend off infection better. Um, let's see, antigen, antigen presenting. Oh. Antigen presentation. Another big thing about uh, antigen presenting or tattletales is your MHC or major histocompatibility complex. Now, um, maybe I mentioned before that when all of us were born, we were all born with, um, you know, whenever we were, when we were all born, uh, you know how they say, they have that saying, uh, uh, they broke the mold and all of us are unique. And it's true, we are all unique chemically. That's why even though you're my twin sister and you try to uh, give me some of your bone marrow, if it doesn't match up through the majority of major histocompatibility complex molecules, guess what's gonna happen? My body will attack um, that donated organ. And that is called uh, graft versus host uh, rejection. And that is never a good thing. So. 
technically we could transplant a whole bunch of things into whole, a whole bunch of people, but our immune system, the MHC complex, and that's what has to match first before we, um, uh, before we do uh, any um, surgery that requires transplantation. And you have different classifications, class one, class two, right? And some of them perform phagocytosis. Uh, but just know that uh, the, the, the biggest takeaway is because MHC classifications are, um, because their, their function is for um, uh, graft versus host rejection and, for, and to maintain uh, that if you have U cells in you and you don't have any foreign cells from uh, anywhere on the outside. Mechanisms and T cells, we kind of talked about it. Uh, already. And here's the thing I was talking about. T helper, right, is a CD4 cell. And uh, T cytotoxic, CD8. The big suppression uh, for um, HIV AIDS patient is CD4. We're always looking at their CD4 count. And guess what? All the medications geared towards interferons and interleukins. Um, and this is TGF um, beta, which is tumor uh, uh, tumor uh, tumor growth factor. Um, we also have suppressors as well, because remember, there also has to be a negative feedback mechanism to tell your immune function, like, hey, that's enough. We already ate what we needed to eat. So that's the biggest takeaway here, CD4 and CD8 designation and what MHC, uh, what do we use that for clinically? B cell. Now here is a um, diagram of an antibody. But you could see here, you see has a has antigen binding site, has like a specific shape. And this is what it looks like in real life. It's just ribbons of proteins all put together. But then you have this, um, uh, um, you have these different chains, heavy chain, light chain. And actually, since they're proteins, we can then, um, uh, we can do an assay or we can do a test on what's what. So um, here's some of the, your immunoglobulins or immune proteins. IgM, huge, right? Uh, IgG, secretory IgA. Uh, IgE is uh, um, typically for allergies. And um, then you have IgD. So the big takeaway with this is um, IgE, think antibodies. And uh, eh, when a minor antiparasitic, but every time I see IgE, I'm thinking what? Allergy. Um, secretory IgA, I'm thinking of uh, issues with tear saliva and um, you know and your mucous membranes. Um, and IgM is the biggest one. Um, that's the best. That's the you know. I'm but IgA, IgE, that's the, that's the more common ones you see, okay? Primary, secondary response. And you could see there's initial exposure. The primary immune response isn't so bad, but you see the secondary, it will respond massively. And you see this curve, it'll also do it quickly. Um, what else do we have to talk about? And you could see it's like a lock and key fit here, right? Activated B cell, meaning it's now kicking out cytokines. Uh, HIV, disinfectants, right? And of course, hand washing, very, very important. And this thing, antibacterial wipes, soaps, and gels, just soap and water, you know, it's the, it's the best thing to do. Um, hmm. Bacteria, fungi, no, not too important. No, 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 no. You know what? Let's now look at our objectives because I think I went over majority of the objectives. So let's look at our objectives. So, because we always have to check, are we doing the right thing? Did we talk about everything? Did we talk about the type of lymphocytes? Yup. 
Did we talk about our lymphocytes came from? They came from bone marrow, right? Specifically, you saw the picture, red marrow, right? Red equals blood. Lymph nodes, we talked about them. We talked about your spleen and its location and its functions. We talked about tonsil, location and functions. We talked about uh, innate in immunity and uh, its subclassification of barrier immunity. And then we also now talked about um, uh, the um, more sp uh, a specific or acquired immunity, and that's your B and T lymph B cells and T cells. Okay, so it looks like we went through all the all of our checklist. Let us now look at what are we looking at for discussion for next week. Recently, more evidence suggests that antimicrobial anti soaps might be causing an increase of drug-resistant microbes. So find out, is this even true? What does this even mean? And if it is true, what should be done? Okay. And it goes, this is also kind of related to, um, you know, nowadays that there's so many anti, uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. I mean, a microbial resistance to antibiotics because um, like, for example, erythromycin, it's barely 40% efficacious. Meaning to say is out of 100 patients, I give a, uh, I give a Z pack to or erythromycin to, it'll only work on like 40 of them out of 100. That's not good, right? And it's because of things like this, they're wondering like, is, there's, is there such thing as too much hand washing? Okay, so that, that's something to uh, look into. And is there such thing as an antimicrobial soap or are these soaps with these extra additives and chemicals, are they clinically uh, superior? And make sure you have um, evidence. Uh, several of you put in a citation just so you could say, hey, I put in the citation, but you gotta refer back to that citation somehow. Um, or do a little bitty of a quote and make sure the quote isn't the majority of your submission. A nice rule of thumb regarding quotes is it really shouldn't be more than 10% of your overall submission. So if you have 250 words, you shouldn't have a quote that's greater than 20, 20 to 25 words. And also it just shows that you can't, uh, you can't speak for yourself. Um, and that's why I love paraphrasing um, um, articles and making my own notes, making it in the way that I can understand instead of just trying to use somebody else's words. Um, there's more videos. These are nice. This is a lovely video here. And it also shows uh, um, another categorization of passive versus active immunity. And that's a nice quick uh, video here. Don't do the lab, but it's got some really nice notes. And looky here, it has some nice notes that are also talked about, you know, a little bit shorter version, also talked about the stuff that we talked about in this chapter. But what is due next week for lesson two, due next week, which is week three. I click on that, I download this case, and look at who, this looks, now the whole world knows what this is. It's a virus, right? And it's part of the coronaviridae family because it's, it's all surrounded by a crown of, and that's what these things are. Now you know what these things are. They're glycoproteins that are on top of the cell wall uh, of this particular virus. And that's what's going to um, um, alert uh, my immune system that, hey, this doesn't belong. So we're gonna look at HIV. And they have the glycoprotein coat, which is, uh, uh, um, glycoprotein 120. Now, here's a scary thing about uh, HIV. We found in the last 10 years, this can now mutate to GP90. So let's say I have medication that's geared towards GP120. It's not gonna recognize GP90 strains. Therefore, my viral load won't be affected by those particular um, um, medications. And then the really horrific thing about um, like um, HIV, which is a retrovirus, and you could um, you could read on what that is. Generally, viruses uh, like Corona, aka SARS two, they hijack the um, um, the DNA inside the nucleus. That means 
um, it can go inside your cell and then do what? Hijack your DNA, which is the blueprint of who you are. And then it tells the cells, hey, we're not making good things anymore. We're gonna make more viruses, okay? If that's okay with you. And it can also do that to the RNA as well. Okay, so that's kind of scary. Here's another little uh, cool thing that's separating uh, B cells and T cells, right? That's nice. But what is do? Um, you know, on page like four and three, just do uh, questions one through four, all parts. That should be enough. And that will, that will be your broad spectrum uh, uh, review for HIV and its relationship to the immune system. All right, so again, to reiterate, just do part one, questions one through four, and they're on page three and four, and all parts, and that should be good enough. Again, in a Microsoft Word document, please have your name on it and state that it's, um, uh, what are we doing? Uh, it state that, the, what case is this? Lesson two, right? And that's this case right here. Alrighty, so to recap, what's due today? Task one, discussion one, lesson one. What's due next week? Task two, discussion two, lesson two, okay? And uh, the task two, of course, is your uh, concept map. Discussion two, your typical discussion on micro uh, uh, antimicrobial soaps. And uh, your lesson two is, of course, um, section one of this particular case, only questions one through four, all parts. With that being st stated, that will.